everyone. Welcome to our Turtle House Digital Fireside. I'm really excited for today's fireside because I have someone on here that I've known for years that is kind of a big deal in Utah. The other two guys are a big deal too, but this guy's really a big deal. And I am so excited to introduce him tonight. So please welcome the one and only David Archuleta. Hi, David. Hey, Carmen. Good to see you. Good to see you too. It's been so long. It's been so long. I'm so excited to catch up with you and talk about everything you're doing um, and how you are. And you're like an adult now. It's weird to look at you with like a beard. <laughs> I, I, well, I, I shaved recently. But it is coming in a Just long. a little bit of a scruff. I like it. Scruff going. Yeah. I like the scruff. David, Thanks. we're going to have lots of fun. We're also, we also have Hank Smith. Hank, how are you? Hi. I can't believe you talked about the, the other two guys like that, but thank you for, <laughs> it's for okay. making such a big deal. I know. I'm just getting you back for your joke that you always say about if someone said that in 20 years I was going to be <laughs> in Idaho speaking with Carmen, I'd be like, I'm going to be in Idaho. Idaho. I love that joke. That is such a classic joke. That's a joke. good joke. Hank's got all the dad jokes. Um, another guy that's got great dad jokes and great hair is the one and only Anthony Sweat. Anthony, thanks for joining us oh, tonight. Oh, I'm so happy to be here. All I know is when you give that intro, I just kept singing in my mind, one of these guys is not like the others. No. <laughs> yeah, right. Three handsome guys, three very talented guys with incredible messages to share with you tonight. We're really excited to get started. Anthony, we could call this our uh, we could call this our American Idol Fireside. Look American Idol Fireside with yeah, fans. Look fans. Yeah, look at that. This is fantastic. I'm excited. This will be fun. I'm excited too. This will be really fun. We'll get into all sorts of great subjects with you guys. We got some advice from the Young Bucks. We can be the Young Bucks, Anthony, or, or David, me and you. Oh, no, you got to keep me in that. Yeah. <laughs> you guys. Listen, Tony's the senior here. The three of us are quite young. I get it. And Tony, hey, I, got, I got braces. I am young at heart. That's true. <laughs> if you have braces, you can be in the Young Club. Um, so brace face. Slash Anthony, yeah. would you mind giving us our opening prayer? I'd be happy to. Thank you. <laughs> our dear Heavenly Father, we're so grateful to be gathered through this technology. Grateful for those who have coordinated it. And we're so grateful, above all, for thy divine son, for his perfect life and example, for his atonement uh, and redemption that we find through him. We pray that thy spirit will attend uh, each of us as we talk and uh, discuss and present and and share our our testimonies of him that so those who watch this will be edified by thy spirit to come unto him and to know thee uh, and we pray that that will help us with this and we give thee all of our glory and all of our love and uh, we do this in the name of jesus christ amen Amen. Amen. Thanks, Anthony. i didn't really hear much of that prayer the whole time i was just feeling guilty for calling you brace face oh you shouldn't that's it, it, I am with it. Okay, Carmen, you have four sons. You've you've got a. You, this is your life. Is that, I, that's the thing is I'm, it's like razzing and teasing and roasting all the time. Carmen, I have I have seven kids. Uh, trust me, I, hear, I hear a lot worse than that. I can take it. <laughs> okay. All right. Good. I'm glad. I'm glad we can tease around and be goofy, but I won't make fun of you anymore. I promise. You go, girl. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and introduce the theme for tonight. The theme is in the world, but not of the world. Um, so as some of you may know, David and I were on American Idol, not at the same time, about four years apart. I think it was four years apart, me 2003 and David in 2007. We were both teenagers when we were on the show and both have very different and yet really similar experiences. There was nothing I don't think more blatantly obvious than being on a reality show to compare being in the world, but not of the world. Um, both as members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, we had values that set us apart from everyone else. And before I went on the show, I was able to get a blessing from my stake president. And one of the things he said to me in the blessing is that I should continue to be a friend to all while... I should be a friend to all while continuing to hold my standards high. And um, 
no, none of the other contestants on my season were members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And so, of course, the first question I got when I went out there was, you're from Utah. Are you a Mormon? And they said, yes, I am. And then the questions just started coming. What do you believe and why do you believe it? And at first I was nervous to share a little bit about who I was and what my values were because I thought they would make fun of me and I wasn't sure how they would take it. Well, those contestants became my family and my best friends and they ended up supporting and sustaining me through the entire experience. And if there was ever a situation that I was offered something that um, I didn't feel comfortable with, they would have my back and say, oh no, she's not gonna do that. One day we were in a limousine. This was right after we performed at the Academy of Television Arts and Sciences. It was like our first group appearance on the red carpet. And it was so exciting. I signed an autograph for the first time. It was wild. And we got in this big limousine after and, and we were driving around town thinking we were pretty cool. And some of the contestants opened the mini bar and started drinking alcohol. And I was sitting in the back of the limousine with my grandma because I was 17. I had to have a parent or guardian with me at all times. And as I was in the back, um, I was sitting right by the mini bar. So people kept asking me, Carmen, will you pass this? And Carmen, will you pass that? And I was thinking, I should just like chuck this out the window. Like, why am I passing the alcohol to these people? I should just like smash it on the road and like make a point. But I didn't, so I was passing one of the, I don't even know what it's called, liqueur bottles to one of the contestants. And as I was passing it to him, we went over the bu a bump in the road and the lid spilled, the lid came off and the alcohol spilled and got on my hand. And for like a split second, I was like, oh my goodness, like can alcohol like seep into my skin and get me drunk? Like I'm gonna smell like alcohol and people are gonna think I'm, I drink and what am I gonna do? And I'm asking my grandma for a tissue and I'm like, it's on my hand. And my grandma's like, calm down, Carmen, like it's fine. And one of my fellow contestants from the back of the limo said, hey, Carmen, I saw how you were eyeing that, that liquor. Do you want some? obviously in his drunken state, mistaking my look of horror for a look of interest. And before I could say anything, Clay Aiken, who was sitting at the front of the limo was like, no way, she does not want that. Mormons wouldn't touch that stuff with a 10 foot pole. And I thought, how cool was it that he remembered what I told him about not drinking and, and stood up for me and was a true friend. Um, I think it's so important that we pick friends that have our same values and standards, but we're not always going to be in situations where we're, we can be around people who believe the same thing that we do. And that's when we get to stand up for what we believe in and, and, um, and love others for who they are and respect them as well. So I'm really excited to talk about how we can stick to our values and what we believe in and what we know to be true while um, living in this crazy world during these crazy times. And I also have such a strong testimony that when we choose to do what's right, that we have support from our Father in heaven. We will have the Holy Ghost with us and there's no greater influence or power that can be with us than the Holy Ghost. We can get through incredibly crazy, impossible situations with his help. And so I wanna bring on our very first speaker today. His name is Anthony Sweat. Anthony and I have spoke several times. Hey, Anthony, at Time Out for Girls many years ago. I, I had only two yeah. kids at the time. When yeah. We, and I have, yeah, four we now. Rolling. What was that? You were just getting rocking and rolling. Just getting rocking and rolling. Um, but Anthony, you are you are awesome. I pulled up your bio to read. Do you want me to read the bio or are you like me and do you hate bios read? I, uh, whatever. I, you I, love I, it. Bio smile. Okay, I'm just going to read it really quickly. Um, besides being an awesome person and one of my good friends, Anthony is an associate professor at the church history of church history and doctrine at Brigham Young University. And um, you received your bachelor's degree in painting and drawing, and then your PhD in curriculum and instruction. Um, you're the author, author of several books, most recently Seekers Wanted, which is one of my very favorite books. I read that a few months ago and loved it. And The Holy Invitation. Anthony, you are a regular speaker at lots of Latter-day Saint events and conferences, and you have seven children. I do, I do. That is amazing. That's I would I would probably guess that maybe that's your greatest achievement is being a dad to those amazing spirits. 
uh, by far, you know, Winston Churchill said the greatest thing he ever accomplished was uh, convincing his wife to marry him. And that's probably my greatest achievement. Uh, and then my kids right there. That's what I care about most. You have a beautiful wife and, and amazing kids and, and, and you're just a wonderful person. Um, and I'm so excited that you're on with us right now. Um, I had never seen your work before as an artist and I was an Instagram stalking you over the last few days and, and looking at all of your incredible artwork. And one of my very favorite paintings is called Relief Society Healing. Oh, I'm, I'm glad you like it. I loved it. And I have been the recipient and the receptacle of, of healing with other women in my family and, and being able to say prayers over my children and offer um, prayers of healing for them. The painting that you have is a depiction of women actually anointing um, mm -hmm. other women and, and, and saying a prayer. And you, you make it very clear that you don't support ordained women or anything like that, but you're depicting a part of our church history that women did used to go around and give blessings of healing. So my question to you is, have you been able in your life to experience that healing power from women in your life, either your wife or, or your mother? And have they, through your faith and the faith of your children, been able to help um, their families overcome worldly challenges and provide healing? Uh, that's a great question. Um, I think the first thing I'd say, of, of course, the answer is yes. Um, the, the first thing I'd say, like in that painting, uh, for those who don't know the history, uh, women used to give healing blessings of faith. They didn't do it by virtue of priesthood offices or anything. They saw it as an exercise of their faith. They did it for about a hundred years. It, it happened for a long time in our church. It was a long time. So it wasn't just a blip on the radar. So I wanted to do a painting that celebrated that, but I also more than anything wanted to do a painting that celebrates the power of uh, women coming together in righteousness and the power they have to minister and to heal. And we have our current prophet president, uh, Nelson, encouraging all the sisters of the church to access and call upon the power of God in their life through their covenants and through the Holy Ghost. And that's what I wanted that image to be a celebration of more than anything. And and I've experienced that kind of healing uh, in my life over and over and over again uh, from women. The, the, you know, scripture that comes to my mind is when Jesus is with the, the invalid man and he says, thy sins are forgiven thee. And some Pharisees say, that's blasphemy. And Jesus says, what's harder to say, rise up and walk or thy, or thy sins are forgiven thee. And then he says, uh, so that you know that I have power on earth to forgive sin. He heals the man. And, I, and I've thought about that for a while. That the greatest healing that ever happens is uh, the healing of our souls, the healing of our spirits. And the women in my life, uh, the greatest healing they've ever done for me, and they continue to do for me, is that they bring me to Christ. Uh, they, they bring me to the person who can truly heal me and heal other people. And I think that's the greatest healing that any of us could ever offer. I completely agree with that. And I don't think I really understood the significance of that until I became a mother. And that's my greatest wish for my children to have a strong relationship with their savior, Jesus Christ, and to be able to experience his healing. And, and if they can know of my love for them and how much faith I have in them, and then, you know, if they know that, then they can, if I can be a, like, like Elder Holland said, like a small part of, of emulating Christ's love yeah. on earth for them, then, then, you know, they can do anything and, and, and be anyone. That's like my greatest wish is that they know that I believe in them, but more than anything that their savior believes in them. And yeah. I, I really believe in that power of yeah. healing. If we can be that kind of a bridge to bring anybody to the healer, the capital T-H-E yes. healer, that's, that's the best thing we can do. Absolutely. Well, Anthony, what message do you have to share with us tonight? Well, I want to share a message connected with that um, about, uh, I want to connect, I'll show you the painting, uh, but I want to talk about three women. And they're sometimes in scriptures called the three sisters, uh, called faith, hope, and charity. And the reason why I want to 
talk about this in, in the theme, our, our, our theme of being in the world, but not of the world uh, is because the, 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 you guys, there's no way to say it. If you and I will gain these three gifts, the gift of faith, the gift of hope, and the gift of charity, more than anything, it will help us to overcome the world and to live and be the kind of people that uh, God wants us to be. So let me show you this, uh, this painting. This is the painting Carmen referenced and um, uh, called Relief Society Healing. And I painted three women and those women could represent faith, hope and charity. They're often, uh, you know, the woman who did the washing, the preparatory, that's the first step of faith. She could represent faith, the woman anointing, which represents the promises or hope. And then the woman leaning over and comforting the other woman could represent charity. And I love, in uh, the history of Christianity, by the way, these three great gifts of faith, hope, and charity are usually represented as female. Uh, what if you go to the next one there, the next slide? Uh, like th th this is an older painting. Uh, sometimes that's why they're called the three great sisters. And go to the next one. Another faith, hope, and charity. And I'll talk about sometimes these symbols they show. Go to the next one. Uh, I like to call this one, by the way, faith, hope, and boredom. I, I love the look on the, the, the women's face there, the one on the right. Um, uh, you'll see like the one woman holding a baby, and sometimes the woman in the middle holds a sacrament cup, and the woman on the right is holding a flower. Go to the next screen. Sometimes they hold, the woman in the middle there is holding an anchor, which represents faith. And the woman on the right is holding a cross, which represents, oh, sorry, the woman with the anchor is hope. The woman on the right with the cross is faith. The woman on the left with the child is charity. And sometimes those, they take those three symbols of love and an anchor and a cross. And, they, and uh, in, in some Christian circles, they put them together into one symbol. Take a look at these symbols. So there's just the straight symbol, cross, anchor, heart. And keep going there. Or sometimes they'll put them into necklaces together like this or go to the next one there. And if you see a symbol like that, that's the cross, the heart and the anchor coming together. And sometimes this is on a out that symbol is outside of the church. If you saw that symbol, they're trying to uh, uh, encourage you and I to gain the gifts of faith, hope and charity through this wonderful church that put that up. Or you can get them on a little necklace pendant. Go to the next slide there, too. The reason why I think it's so important is because if you and I are going to overcome the world, we have to. Um, and when we say world, I think we what we mean by that is sin. We don't believe as Latter-day Saints that the world is evil. We believe uh, that people are good. We believe that knowledge is good. We believe that the world is beautiful. We believe there's lots of great things to offer in the world. When we say overcome the world, or maybe when Christ does, I interpret that as overcoming the worldliness of sin. Uh, that's what we want to overcome. That's what we want to conquer. Um, and so when we get those three gifts of faith, hope, and charity, notice right there in the book of Ether, Ether 12, it says it brings us the fountain of all righteousness, or it will produce spring forward righteousness in our life. So I want to talk about those three gifts and what they are so we quickly understand them and how we can receive them. So let's talk about faith. Um, faith, if you go to the next slide there for me, what? Oh, sorry, before I do go on, I, I forgot I had this. These are my three oldest daughters. Look how cute they are. I just love them to death. And uh, guess what I decided to name my three oldest daughters? Not Faith, Hope, and Charity. But if you want to name your kids Faith, Hope, and Charity, you go ahead. This is Lauren, Regan, and Jane. But um, Lauren, uh, Regan, and Jane, my three daughters, I put them up because you can probably look at their photographs and you can see that they're related. Uh, you can probably tell they're sisters, but they're each different. Faith is different than hope. And hope is different than charity. But they all come from each other. Uh, take a look at this next slide here. Uh, faith leads to hope. And if we have hope, hope will lead to charity. This is how the Book of Mormon teaches it. 
uh, as, um, as Moroni is closing, wherefore there must be faith. And if there must be faith, there must also be hope. And if there must be hope, there must also be charity. Uh, if you study the scriptures closely, you'll see that if we'll act in faith, we will receive hope. And as we receive hope, we will experience charity. So let's talk about what faith is. Faith is like um, a little seed. No, faith is multi, it's, a, it, it's multi-part. It's not just one simple thing. Sometimes the scriptures say faith is believing. Sometimes they say faith is acting. Sometimes they fa- say faith is uh, looking at evidence. So I want to put those three together into a definition for you. And it's uh, this right here, that faith is trust-based action in Christ. What faith means is that you and I trust something that Jesus has taught or that Jesus is encouraging us to do. And we trust it so much that it leads us to act on it. And then when we act on it, we then look at the evidence that it comes into our life that this is the right way. Trust-based action in Christ. Think of it a little bit like this uh, next slide. Um, I like to take my kids swimming. This is not me in the swimming pool. It's just some general photo I found. uh, But every one of us have done this, that we take our kids to a swimming pool, or you've done it as a kid or done it with your siblings. If you haven't, you need to. We put them on the edge. And when I put my little kids on the edge of the pool, I tell them to jump to me. And they pitter-patter their feet right to the very edge. And they look at the water and they get nervous and they reach out and they want me to touch them and they want me to grab them. And if I'm being a good dad, I don't grab them. I actually let there be a slightly uncomfortable gap. And the reason why is because I want them to learn to trust me and I encourage them and I say, I'll catch you. Trust me. Go ahead and jump. I promise I'll catch you. But it's the gap. It's the space that requires faith. And sometimes you and I want God just to tell us everything and to show us everything and just to be right there. But God will always leave a slightly uncomfortable gap so that we learn to exercise trust in him. And so take this little girl. If you click through this slide here, she trusts her father to the point that she takes action and jumps. And then, as the apostle Paul said, faith is the evidence of things. We look at the evidence of her dad catching her. And this is where if you're a dad or a a mom, don't drop the kid. It ruins the whole analogy. Um, You catch him. And then, by the way, you high five him. You tell him you're proud of him. And then what do you do? This is uh, parenting and gospel 210. You take him and you put him right back up on the edge. And this time you might even scoot back a hair forward. And you tell him, come on, come again. And you do this repeatedly until they learn to jump and trust, until they're just flailing into that pool. And you can make the spiritual connections there. God will constantly want us to trust him, take action, look at the evidence. When we start to repeatedly do that in our life, we start to develop the gift of hope. Now, what is hope? Hope is different than just a wish. Like I could say, oh man, I just I just hope David Archuleta sings. I, I, I hope uh, I hope Carmen sings us something. Um, you guys might be like, I, I hope this guy gets done and we can get to, to David and Hank. Um, that, that's a wish. But it, when the scriptures speak of hope, they don't speak of it like a wish. Hope has to do with Jesus. And hope has to do with Jesus' divine promises. So if you go up, uh, show this next slide here, what? This is what gospel hope's not like a wish. Gospel hope is centered in Christ. I go there to the next slide. It's this is the definition I'd give you. It's a personal assurance of God's promises. And so I go ahead and click forward, brethren. I'll just follow you. It's always centered in his promises. This is the book of uh, Mormon, Mormon speaking. What does he have hope for? You have hope in the atonement of Christ. And so it begs this question right here. If hope is that we have a personal assurance of God's promises, well, then what are God's promises through the atonement of Christ? Well, I want to share with you six of them. There's more, but here's six. 
Jesus promises us he will cleanse us from sin. He promises us that he will heal us internally. He promises us that he will restore us, meaning anything that's unfair, anything that's unjust, anything that is part of this fallen world, he will restore and pay back. He promises us that he will identify with us or that he won't leave us alone, that he will feel with us, that he has experienced what we're experiencing. He promises us he'll strengthen us during this mortal life, strengthen us to combat sin, strengthen us to bear our burdens, strengthen us to do good works. And he promises us that he will transform us and change us. He'll take bad people and make them good. He'll take good people and make them great. And he'll take great people and make them like God. He promises us those things and more in the scriptures. But if you take a look at those, one of the ways, if you go to the next slide that you can remember this, is that's the acrostic of Christ. Christ promises those things. And when I get the gift of hope, it's when the Holy Ghost has told me through my faith, has assured me that I will be cleansed of my sins, that I will be healed, uh, that, that God will restore my lost blessings, that he does feel with me, that he will strengthen me. Hope is a personal assurance that those promises of Jesus. And when we get those personal assurances, you guys, we start to be filled with the love of God. And we start to love Jesus and uh, our Father in heaven with all of our hearts, because we feel of their love. And that leads to the third great gift. This is why faith leads to hope, and hope will lead to the gift of charity. When I say charity, you might be tempted to think that charity means like I go out and do nice things for people. Stay with me. That is an effect of charity. Like when we experience charity, that causes us, but that's not the gift itself. Charity, the definition I might give you is this. It's a loving relationship with God. The original word was agape, which means the fatherly love of God for his children and their reciprocal love for him back. So in other words, charity is when we experience the love of God. It's knowing that God loves us and us loving God in return. Let's go to the next one there. Notice how uh, the Book of Mormon uses this. I remember that thou hast said that thou, Jesus, has loved the world, even unto the laying down of thy life for the world. And now I know that this love which thou hast, that's Jesus, for the children of men is charity. Or look at it here, this next verse. Having faith on the Lord, having a hope that ye shall receive eternal life, his promises, having the love of God, meaning love for God. So you're seeing those two things, God's love for you and your love for God. Go to the next uh, one. So remember, it's kind of like in this visual, two halves of a heart, God's love for you and your love with God in return. Now, why does charity matter so much? If you could go to the next one there. Why is it the greatest? Um, And by the way, I know that parents aren't supposed to have favorite children. And any parent that says they don't have a favorite child is lying, by the way. Uh, It might vary from day to day, but but they, they love different children at different times and stages. But God says of the three sisters, the greatest is charity. Well, why? I'll give you three reasons as I conclude. Number one, charity will fill you with joy. Lehi says that as he partook of the love of God, think about it, Lehi ate charity. That's a fun visual. It filled his soul with joy. Nephi said it's the most joyous to the soul. King Benjamin says if you've tasted the love of God, it will bring exceeding great joy to your souls. In this world that is trying to learn how to be happy, charity is the solution. Number two, charity is the key gift of conversion. If God wants to change us, which he does, We have to experience charity. You know, when you you read Moroni 7.45, charity suffereth long and is kind and envieth not, is not puffed up, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked. That is not necessarily describing charity. I believe that's describing what charity affects us to be like. It causes us to suffer long and be patient and be kind. 
So if I want those things, I should get the gift of charity or seek it. And then last, if when we experience how much God loves us, we automatically uh, start to love God's children with the same type of love. I like to use this math formula, love of Christ plus love for Christ equals love like Christ. And President Uchtdorf said it this way, when our hearts are filled with the love of God, something good and pure happens to us. The easier it is to love others with the pure love of Christ. As we open our hearts to the glowing dawn of the love of God, the darkness and cold of animosity and envy will eventually fade. Last scripture, and then I'll conclude with my testimony. Just go to this last slide there, Wit, and we'll I'll put up these last two. Go ahead. My invitation to you is this. Number one, seek the gift of faith through your trust-based action. Seek the gift of hope as you learn of Jesus and his promises. And then pray unto the Father with all the energy of heart that through faith and hope you can experience charity. It's my testimony that if you'll do these things, you will overcome the world. Uh, and the problems of the world, of worldliness. And as the Book of Mormon says there, you will always abound in good works, uh, which is what I believe God wants of us. God bless me and you as we seek to be healed and overcome the world through faith, hope, and charity. And I leave that in the sacred name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Anthony. That's exactly the scripture I was thinking of is Moroni 7, 48 about praying for that charity. And I've done that with my kids. I have prayed to have charity for the ones that weren't my favorites on that day. <laughs> add my testimony to yours that it it is a real thing and he will give you that gift when you pray with sincerity of heart. Hank and David, did you guys have any thoughts um, about David, about Anthony's message that he shared? Well, two things. One, the other day, my kids asked my wife, they said, mom, be honest, who's your favorite child? And she <laughs> said, she thought about it and she said, okay, I'll do it. Um, it's Lucy because she's so sweet to everyone. Uh, and Lucy is our, our neighbor. Uh, so, like you don't have a Lucy. Yeah, I know. So, uh, yeah. And they were like all sat there kind of stunned. And she's like, oh, out of you five? Oh, uh, you, didn't, you didn't specify it was out of you five. You said my favorite child. Uh, um, the other thing I liked was uh, the, the other thing I thought of was we use this term in the church, have faith, right? Uh, just have faith. Um, you know, I'm struggling. We'll just have faith. Uh, and I don't know if that's a great way to use that term, because the way Anthony talked about it, having faith is doing something. We should probably change the way we talk about faith in order for it to be a, an action instead of something I just kind of sit and let happen to me. Right. That I, I have faith. What is that like? Like the force I'm supposed to, you know, I'm supposed to like move something with faith. No, you're supposed to move your feet. That's what faith is. When you kneel down to say your prayers, that's faith. When you go to the temple, that's faith. When you when you go to church, when you read a conference talk, that's having faith. That's moving. That's doing. So I I, I like that, and I like Anthony just in general. Uh, he's he's a handsome. One, one day I, I I might be one of your favorite children. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> you would be my favorite child if someone asked me that. My kids don't care who is my favorite though. They're like, we don't want to be your favorite, Dad. We want to be mom's we favorite. We want to be mom's favorite because yeah. moms are awesome. Moms are just amazing. Well, thanks, Anthony. Um, Hank, we'll talk to you in just a minute. But, David, I want to keep you on and talk to you a little bit. So um, I'll read your bio, and then I want to ask you a few questions. Is that okay? Yeah, and that was great, Anthony, by the way. Thanks for sharing that. That was That was awesome. Okay, so David, you were 16 when you were on American Idol. I was 17, so we were both babies. I didn't know that you were only 16. That's like nuts. And you were in 2008, but season seven. Is that right? Right. And I was 17 by the time it had finished. Okay, so you turned, and I turned 18 on the show. So you had a birthday. When's your birthday? December. Okay, interesting. So so you turned 17 and you were, were you a junior or sophomore? I was a junior. 
Oh my gosh, that's just nuts. So after you were on American Idol, you released your first single, which was Crushed, which debuted at number two on the Billboard Hot 100 charts. Um, that single sold 1.2 million digital copies and then became double platinum. And three months later, your album, David Archuleta, went gold, which is incredible. Since then, you've released several other albums, including a Christmas one, which is beautiful. You had your incredible song, Glorious, um, for Meet the Mormons. Um, and just barely, barely, like what, as of yesterday or two days ago, you released your album called Therapy Sessions, which I have to say is my very favorite um, music that you've released to date. My very favorite song is Patience, and I want to talk to you about that. I love Thank it. You. So you said this about your album. You said, there's been a movement with understanding oneself and going to therapy. I've been on, I've been one of those people on that train and have been discovering a lot about why I have these battles in my head, how to separate myself from the negativity that can flood the mind. I wanted to write about these battles and I've been determined to show that we can win the negativity and anxiety um, when it's telling us that we're not good enough and can't get through it. I'm determined to walk people through with me to prove that we can be the victors of our minds. I love that. And that worrying and paralyzing thoughts aren't what define us, though I will say they can help us become stronger by fighting forward. So just everything about that is amazing. But I don't know if you were like me and, and discovered your anxiety on such a pressure cooker setting as American Idol. That's when I really and really after American Idol is when my anxiety kicked in. My dad's a psychiatrist, so there's always been open dialogue about talking about our feelings and our thoughts and how there's no shame in therapy, medication, treatments to heal our minds and get better. I want to know what inspired you to start going to therapy. That's, that's really great um, that you can have that open dialogue with your dad as well. Yeah. And I think just for parents, that's, that's something important. And, but it's, it's not an easy thing because I think a lot of parents as well just don't know how to have those conversations they don't know how to walk someone through that. Um, right. And, uh, their kids are maybe it'll. It's easier for some parents than it is for others, but I, I think it is worth the try and worth the effort because um, you know therapy. When someone goes to therapy, they're going because they don't know how to have those conversations either, but they're willing to to explore them in a broken broken fashion. Cause yeah. it's like, okay, I'm here to talk by, and you know, then they're like, okay, what do you want? What do you need help with? What can we talk about? And you're like, yeah. well, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> so, right. um, which, you know, I, it's, I think maybe the conversations that I started having with my friends and my family were the things that helped me to gain some perspective that, you know, my way of thinking wasn't always true. The, my perception of my reality and of myself wasn't wasn't the case. And I didn't really trust just one opinion. I'd have to go and talk to other people. But uh, because I was like, well, they might be lying to me because my whole sense of reality just really shifted during my teenage years, especially being on a reality TV show, suddenly having attention from millions of people and then having hundreds of other people constantly around you telling you things. I, yeah, absolutely. And, it just can mess with your perception of reality. Yeah. On a reality TV show. Sure. And that's, that's the funniest thing is that it is called reality because there it's so warped. It's not reality at all, but I love that you have been able to take all of that experience and like musically teach people about what you've learned. You have such a gift of connecting with people um, musically. It's, it's not just because you have an incredible voice, but it, there's just something about your sincerity and your honesty when you sing that connects people to you and, and that endears them to you, that you're so honest. And that's something that I love more than anything is when people are real and honest, that people can say, sometimes life sucks. Sometimes life is so hard. This is what I struggled with. And this is what helps me because that's what helps other people is when we're real and authentic and honest. And one of my all time favorite moments of when you did that is when several years ago when you were performing at a Bravanel hall, this was shortly after American Idol. Um, and, and you were performing and you have this album and, and you're singing your songs and you made a decision to quite literally leave 
all those voices in your head and, and, and all those people and leave the world behind and serve the Lord for two years as a missionary for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And I have to tell you, I've honestly watched that clip like dozens of times. When it first came out, like I, I get chills thinking about it now because what, as soon as those words left your mouth, I have chosen to serve a two-year mission. You couldn't even finish and everyone stood up and applauded you. And so I want you to tell us, um, you said, it's not because someone told me I needed to, it's because of this feeling I had that I've always followed my whole life. And I'm guessing that feeling is the Holy Ghost. But I want you to tell us what made you make that decision of leaving everything behind to serve the Lord? And what advice would you give young adults who are trying to make that decision now? Mm -hmm. Oh, you're you're making me relive that. Um, you you have that so uh, uh, well explained. So thanks for taking me down that memory lane. Oh, um, you know, it, and that actually reminds me of a song. I I wrote a song called "I'm Ready," where it says exactly that. I, I'm not. A, I'm ready to make that change, and I'm not afraid to leave and to lose and leave it all behind. And I know that I can't see around the bend, but if I let you in, I'll know I'll be all right. And it was a process to be able to to trust, to get to that point where I could trust God enough and what he was telling me this time around. Because, um, you know, when I was, there are different times in my life where I felt God speaking to me and guiding me. And I mean, all throughout my life, but I think there are some clear pivotal moments in my life where it was a really clear decision because I, I think he knows how indecisive I am and how much I second guess my choices where he's just like, I'm just going to help you get a really clear answer because this is, it's time to move now. Yeah. And I don't, he's like, I don't, he's like, David, you have your imperfections, but I don't want you to miss this opportunity, which I'm so grateful for. And I, I think of three moments in my life. And the first time was when I was 12 years old and I had, a, I, I got challenged. I was, Yeah to read the Book of Mormon uh, from my bishop. He challenged um, my the, the whole congregation, the whole ward to to read the Book of Mormon. And, and, uh, and so I did. I didn't understand a lot of what it was saying just because there are a lot of big words in there and stories that are can go over my 12-year-old's head. Yeah. And um, even now, like, you know, some things are still hard to grasp, but as I went through that and made the effort kind of acted in faith as uh, Hank was talking about, I started feeling a lot of just clarity in my life. And by getting to the end of the book, there, there's a, a book called Moroni and he's uh, talking, giving promises that if you take the, ch take the time to think about what you've just read to, and then take it to God and ask in prayer in the name of Jesus Christ that these things are true or that these things aren't true, that he will manifest it to you uh, by the power of the Holy Ghost. And by the power of the Holy Ghost, you, should, you can know the truth of all things. Yeah. And he continues sending, giving these promises, Moroni does, at the end of the Book of Mormon. And I was just really feeling it heavy in my – and so I decided to, to just go right there. I, I was scared of prayer when I was younger, when I was 11, 12-year-old, because I didn't think God – really would bother listening to my prayers if there really was a God and he was as big of a deal as everyone was saying he was creator and all knowing, um, all powerful. I'm like, well then why would he listen to me if I have no real significance and I'm not really contributing anything that's really beneficial to <laughs> life. But in that moment, I just didn't care. It's like my fear went away for just long enough from the from being inspired from her own, I had to get on my knees and then pray and say, is this real? Is this true? What I just read, is this really coming from you? Cause I want to know, I want to know if this Joseph Smith guy, was he just, was he nuts and crazy making this stuff up or is what he's saying really making the imp an impact in my life and can make an even bigger impact if I just yeah. continue with this in my life. And uh, I felt like someone just came into my room and knelt down beside me by my bed and, and just said, my son, I know who you are and this is real. This is from me. 
And that was a big deal for me. I didn't have an experience like that until a few years later when I was 16. And I was decided to go on audition for uh, this reality TV show that you might be aware of, Carmen, <laughs> <laughs> that I had watched you on just four years prior yes. um, on American Idol. And I just, uh, same thing, I, like my fair, my family, my friends wanted me to audition, but I just was kind of like, yeah, right. I, I don't think I want to do something like that. I don't think I could. I was still recovering from this vocal paralysis that I had to deal with. And that Dean Kalen was walking me through with voice therapy for a couple of years by that point. Oh my goodness. And I didn't know if I could even sing enough to sing through like three or four songs. No way. And, but I got, I got on my knees again and I, I said, you know, I feel stupid praying about whether I should audition for reality TV show, but I keep getting this feeling that keeps nagging, nagging at me and it won't go away. And I was wondering if it was from you and the same thing had, as it was, basically I felt like someone just knelt down beside me again, put their arm around me this time. And just was like, my son, I know who you are. Go and audition. There's something you need to learn. Wow. And I think bigger of a shock for me than hearing go and audition for American Idol was just the fact that it, hearing God say like, I know who you are when you don't feel like you're much, I didn't know what was going to happen. I was deciding, I'm like, should I really go on audition? I would have to quit my job working at a park. <laughs> a, a park. It was my first job. And I'm like, I really don't want to lose my job. I feel like it's given me some, something in my life to look forward to. I mean, yeah. So this to go on audition, it wasn't even a matter of because I've seen my career happening. It was just like, I needed to learn something, but this is a, a leap of faith for me because I don't want to, I don't want to have to look for another job because I didn't, I thought I was just going to audition and come back. But I, I made the decision after that prayer. It was pretty clear for me. And then everything happened after that. So the third time that had happened was when um, this time with going on a mission, it was, it was that same feeling, but I think I was a lot more scared because I had a lot more of opinions this time around um t telling me what i should be doing with my life everyone was more a lot more interested this time in what i was going to do what was going to happen in my career yeah um and so a lot of when i had talked to people about what i was thinking about doing most people said that's kind of a silly that's kind of a strange thought and a lot of people thought you know who's telling you this who's talking to you they thought you know yeah, right. It's, that's what I was trying to figure out. And, um, you know, my parents had taught me to pray. That's why I, I went to prayer before, you know, my, my mom and my dad had taught me to pray Yeah, and find out my answers. This time when I was trying to figure out to go on a mission, my parents, I talked to each of them and they both said, well, why would you, why would you want to go on a mission if you're already on your mission? And so that made it even more complicated for me because I was like, well, it, maybe, maybe this is the mission because God guided me to this point. Right. Right. So, um, I realized I'm like, you know what, if God keeps speaking to me, then I feel like this might be coming from him. And it, and it was hard. I, I will say as well, a lot of opinions from both sides came from the music business and then people, whenever I'd go to church or, or to the temple, I'd get sometimes people asking, are you going on a mission? Are you going on a mission? And I I don't know if either side really understood how hard or how personal of a decision that yes. it was. But um, I, it took me about like eight or nine months before I really found the clarity that I needed to finally say, you know what, I'm going to do this. And um, I went and... It was hard for me to tell people because I was scared what people were going to think of me, um, especially in the entertainment industry. Because I didn't, I tried to not, I didn't want, you know, like he said, you know, are you a Mormon? Oh, then yeah. you must be this and you must think this way and you must right. have this many moms and just, just all kinds of things that people right. say. And I didn't want to have to deal with all of that stuff because I didn't know how to carry myself through those conversations. But yeah, um, making that decision, uh, and then announcing it at that show in a Bravino hall was like a huge relief for me because I finally was like, I can finally just share 
the struggle that I've been going through the last year trying to make this decision and should I leave my career? Because everyone is looking and counting on me to, to see this career. They've, they've supported me. They've voted for me. They've worked with me. They've put in time. They put in effort to support you. So you feel an obligation to them too. Yeah. Yeah. But um, when I, when I took it away from both sides to put aside the opinions of industry people, even my, and, and my, my parents, my family, my, my yeah. dad in particular, he had been with me through a lot of that. And he was really reluctant with this decision I had made. And uh, but in the end, my parents both came to respect what I chose, but then also on the side of the, you know, members and that expectation, are you going on a mission? Are you going to be an example? And it's just like, you have to separate yourself and say, what do I need? Yes. The second that I said, what do I need for my own well-being and my own relationship with God? Um, that's that's what it came down to. I love that you shared that. Your you're just living proof that Heavenly Father can use someone. You said, "Who am I?" That He can take someone like you and change the world, and that you've blessed so many lives from your decisions and and through your music. You've changed so, so many lives, mine included. Um, and I'm just, I'm grateful to know you and, and to call you my friend. So thank you so much for sharing that. Do you have a message that you want to share about not being in the world, but of the world? Not being in the world. You know, I, I'd say it's to, to make that choice. You know, God asks us and Christ has asked us to be a light in the world. And to, to shine that light, not be afraid of that. And when there might be a lot of darkness and people making choices that it's not like they're evil, but they're making choices that prevent that choose, make them choose a way that's not going to have as much light in those, sure. those choices. And so it's hard to feel like I don't really want to do that stuff because then it's going to make me stand out and it's going to look awkward and people aren't going to understand that because it looks different trying to make choices that keep you cleaner. Yeah. Um, I've had a lot of people say, well, Oh, you're so naive. Oh, well, that's the innocence. If only you had known and stuff, or if you just would try this or you just need to experience more things and then you would understand. And I don't think people realize it's like, you know, I know what's going on around me and the choices other people are making. It's a conscious choice for me to choose to do something else and, and to just try to do what I feel God has asked me to do. And, and don't, don't you feel like because we were in the situation that we were watching everyone make those decisions, it was almost clearer to me of why I did not because I saw how unhappy they were. I would see how the drinking and the drugs and the girls and the guys and the partying would actually bring them down and, and affect their spirits and their self-esteem. And so for me, it was a wonderful learning opportunity to be like, I can see how you're living and, and I don't want that. And even if they would say the same things to me, like you're so innocent and you're just so naive and you know, same things. And yet they would also say, and yet you seem so mature. Like you just, you just know what you want to do. You just, you seem like you're really mature. They didn't know what that was. And it was being able to not make those decisions, right. That we can see, I, I can see how you're living your life. And now it's clear to me why I wouldn't want to live my life the same way. Right. Yeah. I, I do want to say like, just, just because there are people around us who make those choices. Um, it doesn't always mean that they're, they're unhappy. There are people who do things that we choose not to in our, in our church that are very happy and can be great examples in other ways. Even if they do drink alcohol or other things like that, it's, you know, drinking alcohol doesn't make someone a bad person. Right. But I've, you know, when they ask like, what, why don't you do that? Like, this doesn't make sense to me. A glass of wine is, can be healthy uh, if you do it each day under control. And you, you know, it just comes to the thing where it's like, you know, it's, it comes down to the thing of self-discipline and believing that we we follow a, this uh, moral code that God has asked us to, to live, to support 
people who, you know, to, uh, I love my institute teacher would even say like about um, the word of wisdom, like no alcohol, no tobacco and no uh, choosing not to participate in drugs and things, which there's a lot of in the entertainment industry and people are like, come right. on, work with your creativity. And I'm, I'm not going to lie to them like, man, how much more creative would I have been if I was in this, you know, making all these cool songs that everyone else is making. If I, <laughs> But, you know, but still choosing to say, you know what, I've, I, I believe in God. I believe that there are prophets and I believe that they receive revelation. And I, I want to make that choice to follow. Yeah. And, and if, and if you don't follow things perfectly, if you make mistakes, what's beautiful about the gospel of Jesus Christ is you can, you can, you can recognize your mistake and say, I'm, you know, I'm going to try again. I'm going to try and be better. And I think that's another thing. Um, when people are like, oh, you're so innocent and they're like, oh, you're so great. And you don't seem to do anything wrong. And it's like, you know what? No, I just really trust that God has a power to forgive when I do make mistakes. And I feel like people can see, you know, whether you've been able to um, stay following commandments all your life or you've been able to feel the power of forgiveness change you to make you clean. I think people who are living and making other choices different than you are going to notice that difference. And they'll be saying like, you know, there's something different about you. That was something I would get a lot from people. They'd say, you know, there's something different about you. Yes. Like, this is so strange. They're like, wait, what? You don't, you don't go to parties. Right. What? You never take girls back with you and thus. I'm like, no. And they're like, why not? I'm like, you know, it's, it's just a choice that's important to me that I want to stick to. And I remember one of one time I was with this with this group of people at the studio and they're just like, that is so weird. <laughs> but then one of them said, that is so that is so cool. And that that always made a, an interesting thing to me because they're just like, wow, you're so weird. So I would just say, sorry, that was a long way of saying don't it's it's OK to be different. Yes. And you sometimes we just need to learn how to be OK with feeling uncomfortable by being different and making a choice to be different um, because as weird as people might think we are um, to begin with, they'll start seeing that there's a difference in by being able to make a choice yes. to, keep a, to keep you close to God and, and Hey, shine that light. I love that. When I was um, on season two, I had, Julia D'Amato and Kim Caldwell come up to me after um, this was on tour and they said, we've decided through watching you that when we have kids, we're going to raise them Mormon <laughs> 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 just because we want them to be clean like you and, and, and good like you. And a few years ago, we actually went out to the funeral of Ricky Smith, who was on my season. He was killed in a car crash and it was terrible. And we all got together and they said, so you're married now? And I said, yeah. And they said, you've got kids. Yeah. And, and you know, I'm 35 now. And they said, do you still not smoke? And I said, I still don't. And they said, do you still not watch rated R movies? I said, I still don't watch rated R movies. And like, do you drink? I said, I don't drink. And Julia leaned over to me and she said, never change, never change. And I think what you said is perfect. That the thing that makes us different is that we have the power of the Holy Ghost with us and um and we're trying to be like Christ and we're trying to like Anthony said share his love for others through through us and and I do that through my motherhood and music and you've been able to do that through your mu music is I think that's the greatest gift of having that talent is to be able to share heavenly father's love for his children through, through music and, and through speaking. That's, that's been the biggest blessing for me through all of this is when I speak and when I sing in front of people, it's, I used to do it because, oh, it's fun to be recognized and to be liked. And now when I go to speak, it's mostly like church events and I can like literally feel heavenly father's love for these people through me. And that's been the coolest thing that I've been able to take from that is to feel his love for them. And that, that's exactly what you're doing. I honestly couldn't be proud of you. I feel like I'm I'm like your older sister. I'm just so proud of you and everything that you are and everything that you've become. So thanks so much for sharing with us today, David. Oh, thank you, Carmen. Good to talk to you.
Good to talk to you too. Hank and Anthony will bring you guys up really fast. Um, do you guys have any thoughts you want to share? I just want to say amen. Yeah, that was awesome, David. It's, David is so impressive to me. You know, he could have he could have easily turned me down when I when I shot him a message and said, "Hey, do, you want to do one of these uh, firesides." Uh, he easily could have turned me down. He could have said, "You know what? I try to keep a distance between my public, you know, career and you know, and my membership in the church." But he was so quick to respond, like, "Yeah, I would I would love that. I'd love to be part of that." And that 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 to me is. Uh, incredibly impressive. I remember um, Elaine Dalton. You remember Elaine Dalton, Tony? Yes. You're old enough. Oh, you know, oh, Elaine. Oh, I love Elaine. Yeah, she, love would, she would frequently say, uh, you can't make a difference unless you're different. Yes. That's the whole to that. You can't yeah. make a difference unless you're different. When David, when you use that word of uh, weird, I, I thought of the scriptural word peculiar. Yes. Uh, where God specifically says, I, I want to raise a peculiar people. A different people. Uh, I, I, I think you're such a great. I, I just kept thinking as you were sharing that uh, when the Lord said to Joseph Smith, "Don't don't fear men more than God." I just kept thinking of that the whole time through your message of you listening uh, to the to the inner voice that's coming from above and 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 being a great example of that. And I'll, I, I have to add, and I've told David this before, but in the resurrection, I will have that hair. <laughs> that is that is good looking. Tony, can you see me with that hair? That hey, you can't have everything, Hank. If you had that, it would, right. it would just go to your head too that's much. Exactly. It's true. Now, that's a dad joke, right? Yeah. That's right buddy. Good voice, good hair, good speaker. Yep, he's got it all. All right, Hank, you're going to close us out here today. I had a big long bio I'm going to read, but I'm just going to say that you're awesome and hilarious and funny and um, and a very good friend and a very good person. So tell us what you're going to talk to us about today. Thanks, Carmen. Um, I think I want to talk about, well, first of all, uh, I want to thank David and Tony for uh, and and you for taking uh, up my offer to, to come and do this. I just think these are so fun. And, and thank you for all of you who are tuning in. Thank you for taking uh, your time of, you know, uh, to, to sit and, and listen. And I hope something from this has been uh, beneficial for you, something from your family that you can say, yeah, I'm, I'm going to use that. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to apply that in my life this week and see, see if it makes a difference. The things we're talking about are like brush strokes, right? They, they're, they're little tiny things uh, that, that, you know, one individually is not all that impressive, but uh, when you, when you, Put them together. When you just keep putting those brush strokes on day after day after day, uh, then uh, these small small things become uh, become big, and they make a you know they make the masterpiece what it is. If you want to have a masterpiece of a life, you have to start with uh, tiny little tiny little brush strokes. Um, I love social media. I'm a big fan of social media, and I use it often. I think of uh, social media as kind of like the title of liberty, right? You have to be brave enough to to kind of say this is what I this is what I believe in. And <clears throat> the other day, Carmen uh, reminded me of something I put on Instagram. She said, "I really liked what you said about uh, there's a there's a powerful beauty that comes from those who um, who have been through really tough times and have have risen from it." Uh, and so I thought about that and I want to, I want to tell you about someone just, just briefly, I'll be quick. Um, I know you came to listen to David and many of you have already, uh, gone to get your own personal refreshments. Uh, but, um, uh, if you're still listening, um, I want to tell you about a friend of mine. She, uh, I met her when I was doing a book signing. Now, uh, when David Archuleta does a, an album signing, uh, or, or, you know, a, an event, People line up around Costco nine times. Uh, when I do a book signing, I sit awkwardly at a table in a bookstore uh, and uh, people think I'm trying to sell them something, right? They come in and they look a little odd and they try to look left and right. Like, I, uh, I got to avoid this guy. And I'm like, yeah, hey, listen, it's in the contract. I have to be here. Um, well, this one time I went to a book signing <clears throat> and luckily there was another author there. And so I sat down next to her and uh, I immediately knew she was... Um, uh, that she was a little bit different than most people that you uh, would see. She had uh, a, a bit of a, a deformity in her head shape. And um, as I sat down next to her, um, I knew I was going to be there for two hours. And the only person who comes to these things is my mom. Uh, so I said, hey, uh, what's your name? And she didn't look at me. She looked straight ahead. Um, and she said, my name's Chris. 
And I saw that she was, I could tell right then she was blind. And I said, uh, Chris, uh, what's your book about? And she said, oh, it's kind of my life story. And I said, oh, um, well, we got a couple hours and I don't know if your mom comes to visit you on these things, but um, can you, uh, I'd love to hear it. Uh, I'll buy a copy of the book. And so she started to tell me her story. And as she told me this story, I realized uh, that this woman had been through more uh, difficulty than I would um, in just, uh, you know, a short time period than I would ever, I'd seen my entire life. Um, she, uh, when she was a baby, she uh, was diagnosed with cancer, just eight months old, uh, cancer in her eyes. And after the, after the treatment, it left her head uh, with a, a bit of a deformity uh, as, she, as she grew up. Let me show you a picture of her. Her name's Chris. This is Chris. And you can kind of see uh, the, the treatment around her eyes stunted uh, the growth around her eyes. Um, <clears throat> but she kept going through life. She said, you know, a little bit difficult to go through elementary school and junior high with people uh, saying things about, you know, the way I look. She said, but eventually I got past that. And uh, and then um, she said things got really uh, difficult uh, again when she was about 40 years old, uh, when uh, doctors told her that uh, they would need to remove her right eye. You can see from her picture that she has a prosthetic eye over her right eye. And uh, that was the only eye she could see out of was her right eye. And uh, she said, I'll be blind. And they said, yeah, uh, but the cancer is is returned and it's going to grow to your brain if we don't remove your eye. And uh, she said um, the day of the surgery came. In fact, she asked me this question. I want you to think about it. She said, Hank, what would you look at if you know you only had uh, eight days left to see? And I said, uh, I don't know. I don't know. I've never thought about that. And she said, I'll tell you what it was for me. Cause I had, you know, she had eight days left to see. She said, one was color. Uh, Chris is a florist. And she says, ah, it was the color. I didn't want to, uh, I didn't want to give up color, right? The beautiful red and against the dark green. And then she said the other was, of course, my children. She had two, uh, she had two sons at the time, Christopher and Benjamin. And, um, and then her, her wonderful husband, James. And she said, I, uh, I was going to miss their faces. She said, I was very blessed because I was going to get to live, but I also, I knew I was going to miss those, those faces. And they were just, you know, little at the time. So she's trying to get them to hold still so she can stare at them and they don't want to, you know, they're little boys and they don't want to be stared at. Um, she said the day of the surgery came um, and uh, they, uh, the doctors um, allowed James to come back uh, with her to the surgical room and um, they said, okay, we're, we're ready to go. And, and James bent down and kissed her and, and he said, Hey, be good. Okay. And uh, she said, James, we're going to have to, we're going to have to work on your goodbyes. And, uh, he smiled and my friend, Chris, she shut her eyes. And that was the last thing she saw when she woke up hours later, um, her eye had been removed. Um, and, uh, she was completely and totally blind. And there was a moment, she said, uh, for about six weeks, she said, I just laid in bed and felt sorry for myself, right? And we've all had moments like that, where we're just like, I'm going to lay in my bed and feel sorry for myself. And then um, she said, I went to church uh, uh, for the first time, and a woman came up to me, and uh, very seriously, she said, Chris, I've decided I'm going to help you. I'm going to teach your boys sign language. And uh, Chris said, what? What? Uh, why would you teach them sign language? And the woman said, you need to be able to communicate with them. And she's, she said, Hank, for the first time in six weeks, uh, first time since the surgery, I laughed. And she said, it felt so good to laugh. And all of a sudden she said, I realized I'm blind. Now I could be mad about it the entire time. Uh, and I could spend my whole life wanting to not be blind, or I could I could laugh and smile and accept my life. Uh, and she decided it felt so good to laugh that she did, she wanted to laugh for the rest of her life. Um, and she did. Uh, she laughed uh, for the rest of her life. Um, she, hilarious, an absolutely hilarious woman. She told me stories there while I was sitting there at that um, at that book signing uh, that I, I was crying laughing so hard. She said that uh, she said little children will sometimes, uh, when she does the school assemblies, someone will raise their hand and say, 
uh, well, they'll raise their hand, first of all, and she never calls on them because she can't see them. And she said, uh, but eventually someone will say, this girl has a question. And she said, ma'am, how do you drive a car? And she said, um, she said, I don't get offended at questions like that. Come on, they're just little. So she said, I just stick my cane out in front of the car and wave it around. If I hit another car, then I swerve. And the little girl said, oh, okay. Uh, one boy said, how do you watch TV? She said, oh, I just, I just, I walk up to the TV and I touch it and I can feel the people moving around. And he said, oh, okay. Uh, she said, one time I was at church and I wanted to go get a drink. Uh, she said, but so I just had to listen by the drinking fountain for a minute, make sure no one's already there, right? Come up behind them and hug them. She said, nobody was there. She said, um, church members slurp really loudly when they're at the drinking fountain. But she said, as I walked up, I put my hands down to, to hit the bar on the drinking fountain. And apparently there was a man there. Uh, she said, I, what was he doing? He wasn't drinking. He was pondering eternity. I don't know. She said, but I, I, I gave him, I knew it was, uh, the oldest man in our ward because when I put my hands on his, um, back end, uh, she said, I heard him go, Oh, uh, and she immediately backed up and I'm crying as she's telling me this story. And she said, I said, I, she said, I went like this, which I don't know why I went like this. Cause I'm blind. Uh, she said, but I said, oh, brother so-and-so, I'm so sorry. Are you okay? And uh, brother so-and-so was walking away, kind of laughing. And he said, well, uh, Sister Belcher, I am now. Uh, and she she was just absolutely uh, hilarious. Um, and she taught me so much. Now, unfortunately, uh, very unfortunately, uh, Chris passed away uh, this last January. Um, uh, but she left a legacy for me. Um, to choose um, to choose happiness, uh, to choose laughter um, in in all this difficulty. I think that's part of being in the world, but not of the world. Is not being pessimistic, not being cynical, not letting these things become kind of a guiding philosophy in our lives of anger and resentment. Uh, so I want to show you something just Chris wrote in her book. Uh, let me show you the cover of her book. Uh, it's called Hard Times and Holy Places, and here's what she wrote. She said, uh, wait, go to that next one. She said, no one schedules adversity. We don't look at our day planners and say, oh, today I'll drop the kids off at school, go grocery shopping, get a fatal disease, pick up the dry cleaning, have marital problems and take dinner to sister so-and-so. If I have time, maybe I can lose my job or my house could burn down. Or maybe I should put that off till tomorrow. She said, no, in this mortal world, we have no need to schedule trials. They just come. Then she said, don't allow your heart to be hardened by hard times. Now, if I were to say that, you'd say, you don't know hard times, but this woman has known hard times. She said, don't allow your heart to be hardened by hard times. Make the choice to turn to Christ. There is a purpose in your suffering. You and I are being changed, remodeled, stretched, and polished for eternal glory. I was so touched by what uh, David, um, uh, by his creation of this album about therapy. Uh, to me, that is so just incredibly brave and 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 really groundbreaking to create an album about uh, about going to therapy. And some people might say, "No, no, I just have the gospel. I don't need therapy." I think the Lord gives from the therapists I have known and the therapists I have talked to. Uh, the Lord gives certain people gifts uh, that will bless us uh, along the way. And I think that's part of what Chris says here. Uh, she's saying, "You and I are being changed." remodeled, stretched, and polished for eternal glory. That's part of what I think David was talking about in his, uh, in, with his album and with his message. If we trust in and choose Christ amid our difficulties, and remember what Anthony said, right? Trusting in and choosing Christ is about action. It's about faith, hope, and charity. It's about moving, right? If we'll trust in and choose Christ amid our difficulties, our hard times will become holy. And then to finish, she said this, she said, I wish I could comfort the woman I was five years ago. When she wrote this, um, it had been five years since her surgery. She said, I wish I could hold her in my arms and promise her you're going to make it. I tell her the pain will eventually subs subside. I tell her you're going to smile. You're going to laugh again. Uh, it might be sound kind of cheesy, but if those of you who are really struggling, you might want to close your eyes and see if you from five years, if you can, if you're really quiet, you can hear you yelling back. Um, through the years, you're going to smile. You're going to laugh again. There is hope. There is happiness ahead. There is so many good things. Uh, you need to, you know, trust the Lord. Trust that He is the High Priest of good things to come. Here's what she says. She says, "I have may I may have lost my sight, but my vision has never been clearer. I may have lost my sight, but my vision has never been clearer." And that's my hope and prayer uh, for all of you listening. 
um, that you'll say from something that Carmen or David or uh, Anthony said tonight that you'll say that gave me a clear vision. I'm going to embrace that uh, and I'm going to I'm going to move forward. Uh, I'm going to be in the world and I'm going to make a difference in this world. Um, and there are a lot of people doing it. I love what David said about, you know, you don't have to be a member of the church to make a difference. Uh, there are lots of good people around making a difference. But knowing what we know, uh, we can also make a profound difference. Uh, and I hope that you'll say to yourself, no, I want to I, I want to do that. I want to be me. I, I, you know, I want that to be me. I want to I want to change some lives. I want to bless some people. Um, and in doing so, I think you will. I hope that you will. And I think you will feel the gratitude of the Lord uh, when he. Uh, I, I, I've felt that before in my life, and I hope you will as well when he, um, not that, you know, not that he owes me anything. I'm an unprofitable servant, as King Benjamin says, but I think the Lord is grateful when we decide, uh, when we decide we're on his side, right? When we're going to do what he wants us to do more than, more than what anybody else has ever asked of us, uh, when he is our, when he is our focus, um, you'll feel uh, I think you'll feel him working shoulder to shoulder with you, as Jacob says in Jacob chapter five. And I leave that with you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Hank. Chris is who inspired me to take off my makeup when I would speak at Time Out for Girls. I remember that. That's I would take off my eyelashes. I take off my makeup and talk about what true beauty really means. And it's funny, the first time I did that, I was explaining to Chris what I was doing. I'm like, now I'm taking off my eyelashes. Now I'm taking off my lipstick. And Chris is like, don't take off anything else. That's <laughs> <laughs> just like her. Stop it. She, so quick, so quick witted. She's so quick. She was so yes, awesome. She, she was, was always so positive. And and she's awesome. And thanks for sharing your message about having clear vision and, and about being positive, no matter what trials you're going through. And David, about taking your trials and, and becoming a better person because of them. I love Anthony, what you said about faith, hope, and charity. My wife is cutting out. If anybody can hear this, sorry. <laughs> Hi, Anthony's wife. Um, and about feeling Christ's love for others um, and being able to share that love through our unique talents that we've each been given. Um, and we each have unique talents and they're there for a reason. And like David said, who am I to do anything great? You're a son or daughter of God and you were born with greatness inside you and you truly can change the world and do incredible things. So thank you everyone for being with us today. Um, we're going to end with a closing prayer. Hank, will you offer that for us? Yes. And I'll, I'll I, I, I won't pray for it, but I'll, in my heart, I'll pray that Anthony is okay. Wherever, <laughs> wherever we lock him to in world, on the internet, wherever Anthony is, uh, <laughs> I hope he's making a difference. <laughs> All right, I'll say the prayer. All right. Our Father in heaven, uh, we're grateful uh, for the technology which enabled us to be together. Uh, we're grateful for uh, the spirit that we felt and for uh, those who have presented. Uh, please bless all those who participated tonight, either by speaking or, um, or by watching or listening. Uh, please bless us all with an increase of the spirit uh, that we can go forward uh, and that we can radiate the light of thy son. Uh, that we can um, repent, keep our covenants, and um, embrace more fully our roles as uh, disciples of Jesus Christ. We love thee, Father, and offer this prayer in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Amen.